Um, today we are going to be talking about the Verbolten roller coaster. Uh, this is very similar to all the other roller coasters that I've had the the um, pleasure of being involved in the design process over the last 25, 30 years at, at Bush Gardens for all their rides out there and also Water Country USA. And we're really going to be talking about kind of a thousand foot overview about the different design considerations and the construction considerations that goes into a roller coaster. Most of you may be familiar with Bush Gardens. There's not but so much space out there. Typically what happens is when they're considering a new attraction, um, they got to figure out, are they going to get rid of one or are they going to find some new land to build one on? So this particular um, coaster, the Verbolton, it is actually built over the old Big Bad Wolf roller coaster. So that is one of the first things they always got to consider is where are they going to even put these things? So we um, out with the old coaster, we demolished that or the, the park demolished that. For the new ride, which is the Verbolton, which is based off of um, this particular ride was themed off of the Germany um, Autobahn. And it was based off of a development of a car riding down a, a country road or the, I'm sorry, the Autobahn lightning strikes. And then the car cascades off into dark forest. And that's hence the whole theme behind this ride. So there's a lot of theming conceptual things that go on before we as engineers, geotechnical engineers, even get involved in the design process. But one of the first things is always, what are we doing? We're gonna be building a new coaster attraction, um, always as part of a, a roller coaster is you have the station building that of course loads and unloads um, visitors. Um, we have an events building that we'll talk about um, a little bit more in detail about why that was so complex and the design for this particular um, attraction. Um, there's a covered bridge on this ride, and then there's this regular open ride of, of track area, what we call open ride. It's just where you're out in the open. And the interesting and unique thing about this particular coaster is we reused a lot of the old foundations from the old Big Bad Wolf roller coaster. So just conceptually to kind of, you know, figure out where you are within Bush Gardens. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you has, has, has been in Bush Gardens walk around, but it's in the Germany area. Um, at the top of the screen, you see the big Oktoberfest um, fest house and the Verbolten is on the, the lower portion of the screen. They just have the depiction of the Verbolten coaster in there. And it's right beside the basically the Autobahn or the bumper cars in Germany. So the conceptual design, there's a lot of things going on in this. If you're not used to reading um, construction drawings or, or conceptual design drawings, at the very top, um, I don't know if you all can see my cursor or not, but at the very top of the screen, there's the existing, existing station building. And that's, we were going to reuse the existing station building with some modifications for this new ride. And then you can see these lines going around the track into here, which is the events building. Um, and then the lines come back out and it kind of goes around the ride until it comes right back to the station building. Now, this drawing is very important to us on any design element because it has um, a lot of these smaller lines I know you don't have to worry about how you read those lines, but the tiny little lines are incremental elevation changes. So there are port, parts of this ride where there's over 90 foot of elevation change between the coaster itself and the track ride itself. So what that means is, you know, there's, there's a significant amount of manipulation that we have to do on the job site and how that, how that translates to su support for the rod in the buildings are handled differently at every stage of what we got to look at. Now, our challenges for, for this is it's previously developed site. Again, like I said, there was, already, there was an old coaster on this particular property. Um, we look at old studies. This was a very old coaster. It was done back in the early 80s. Back then, they didn't have a lot of good historical documentation or engineering reports like we do nowadays. So there's very limited information that we could pull from. 
uh, the varying to topography and site conditions. Again, while the rod elevation change about 90 some feet, the building, the events building that we'll look at in a little bit, um, that had over 20 some feet of fill that required what that was required to, to make that building pad level. And I'll explain that a little bit later. So, which is deep ravines that were required to have a lot of um, engineering soil be put in, put in. And then there's just this whole accessibility. How are we going to get our, our, um, our devices and tools and rigs? How are we going to traverse this area that's, that's heavily um, populated by old structures in slopes and hills and valleys? We got to be able to get in here to be able to do our testing the way that we need to. The other challenge is, is the existing foundations. Sometimes those get in the way and it creates problems for what they need to have new foundations for support of the structures. There's a lot of soft soils out in this vicinity of the project site. The coaster loads um, that were designed by um, the, the folks in Germany. And at the stage that we're brought in on these projects, typically the loads have not been finalized. There's a lot of different loads that are going on as a coaster traverses a track. This is different than a, a building um, that's just sitting on the ground. That's kind of a known load that's in one place. It's just pressing downward and that is it in a, in a general sense. So as, as the coaster goes around the track, it's, it's imparting different forces and stresses to the foundation system, which that translates to the soils. And that's what we got to figure out. How do we make the soils handle the load that it's being impo imposed on it? And one of the biggest things is not so much how, how much axial load or how much downforce load are we, are we trying to resist, but the deflection. Think about as that track, as the coaster or the car is trying to go around a curve, it's trying to be thrown off the track. And so that, that stress that is on the track at that point, it's trying to push the support um, away from the track. So we got to minimize that deflection of, um, of the track. And, you know, soils does not behave like steel. Um, they have a deflection criteria of an eighth of an inch deflection. And that is a pretty tight um, uh, specification that we have to adhere to to make sure that this track stays in place or the foundations more specifically stay in place and it doesn't move off the, the, the track and have a problem. And you wouldn't necessarily think this, but language becomes an issue. Um, a lot of the coasters that are designed, they're, do they're done from um, foreign nationals. Um, we have um, Switzerland has done several coasters. Germany was specific to this one. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's a language barrier of um, either translation and or just it's, it's very hard sometimes to understand the, the um, accent. With that, um, units. A long time ago, when I was in engineering school, they were talking about how everything in the U.S. is going to be converted to the European standard metric system. Um, that, of course, obviously never happened because we still do everything predominantly in English units for construction industry, manufacturing industry, things like that. However, these designers being overseas, they only deal in the metric system. So, you know, it was interesting for the first time I started getting involved in these things. Um, I was having to figure out all the metric system. A simple conversion is, is uh, pretty simple. But when you're dealing with every unit of measurement that's required on these particular projects, if you you can you can maybe totally understand if if I'm trying to do a design in English and I transpose something incorrectly in metric or vice versa, that could be a big problem on um, the design feature of it. So understanding on how the the units, not only the units, but the standard of measurement is very critical in these structures because again, we got to make sure we're speaking the same language with respect to the units and the conversions of it. And the other big thing on these things is time. Uh, me and Jim offline were talking a little bit about the speed of which these projects occur at. Um, typically we have to get in and get out of the park during the off season um, to be able to collect our information, to be able to run through the design process. Now the park is open later and later in the year. It's not only open during the spring and summer months into the fall, 
but then they have hollow screen. So a lot of the park is open during the October timeframe through Halloween. Then they also are open again during Christmas time, during Christmas town when that is open. And a lot of the rides are open then. So we have a very narrow window into the time of, of getting our information and getting out of the park so we're not disrupt, disrupting visitors. And I always kind of jokingly say about how, how much time or how fast does this thing happen is during the conceptual design, that probably occurs a year before we're even brought into the picture. Um, the owners of Bush Gardens, they're looking at, hey, what kind of new ride, new kind of traction might be neat for today's, um, for today's tourists and visitors. So they're having those conversations up front. Once they have a conceptual layout is when they contact us. And then we get involved with then, again, some of the things I talk about with the foundation design, everything that they got to do to this, to, to be able to build this thing. But I had a situation on, um, I can't remember if it was this one or one of the previous ones where I got, I took a phone call from Bush Gardens. I could tell he was in a conference room and it was the designers. He was, he happened to be over in Switzerland at that time with the rod designers for that particular coaster. And he said, Mike, you know, I'm over here with the designers. I need to get a copy of your geotech study so we can know what we need to do in certain areas for the design on this thing. I know you did this a long time ago. Go ahead and send us a copy of the report so we can we can uh, start our analysis. And I'm like, you know, I knew I was on speakerphone. So I was like, can you take me off speakerphone? Um, he goes, well, no, just go ahead. Everybody's here. We're ready to go. Send us the thing. And I was like, well, you never authorized us to do this site work. So that was a situation where they thought they had released us. They hadn't. And his very next comment to me was, all right, well, consider yourself authorized to start your study. And oh, by the way, you're holding us up now. So it's, it's always an afterthought for the engineering that needs to go into these things. And it's everybody is under the gun and under the clock. And because a lot of our information the coaster designers cannot do their piece in determining the loads until they can figure out what the soils and what their rod um, can actually handle. So with that, again, our design ob objectives, we know it's gonna be a new coaster. There's gonna be buildings, there's gonna be slopes, there's gonna be foundations for the, the coaster and also the buildings. There's retaining walls, there's existing foundations and there's stormwater management. Now, we're not going to address every one of these items right here. There's not enough time today. But the first thing we always look at is foundations. What kind of foundations are we going to use to support this structure? Everything costs money. And we want to be sure we want to make sure that everybody's being smart about the money because these things can get very expensive, very costly, depending on what kind of foundation system we're looking at. We have the shallow foundation system. Typically, this is, is it's very practical and it's easy to support any of their building and ancillary support structures because it's just a standard building um, with not heavy loads. We're not building skyscrapers or five-story buildings. It's just a simple little single-story structure. Um, a shallow foundation system, they just dig in the ground, pouring in their concrete, and, and the bearing pressure that we develop um, is, is easy to handle it. The, 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 uh, the coasters are supported on piles, and there's a variety of different piles that are utilized in different situations and for various reasons, um, predominantly load conditions. But there's auger cast, there's driven, and there's drilled shafts. We're going to be looking very specifically at driven and drilled shafts, and there's other combinations of things that we'll look at a little bit also. But typically open track areas where it's just you see the rails and the car is going to be running down the track, a typical driven pile that's very readily, um, it's just y'all have seen it maybe at some point in time at a building site or on a bridge. It's just a concrete or steel pile and you see those big, the, those big um, pile drivers out there and make a lot of noise that are just banging the, the, the concrete pile into place. And that's what develops the support capacity. The biggest issue we had, however, as I talked previously, is the events building. And again, this is a themed building where the coaster enters the building. Um, if some of you have ridden this thing, it, it's pretty cool, it's kind of scary, depending on what level you're at. But it enters the building and it, and it goes through a series of loops and drops. 
that you really don't even feel because it's completely dark in this building. It has flashes of lightning that's uh, representing lightning that's going on, some fire that's going on. And then it goes around this little inside this building that you're not even aware how many loops and turns you're doing till it hits an elevator shaft. And then it drops, uh, um, I believe it's um, nine feet, it drops, and then it shoots out the other end of the building. Well, as you, as you might imagine, as I kind of tried to, to explain, as a car goes around, as the car, meaning the, the, uh, the coaster car, as it goes around these turns, it's trying to push the track sideways, because it, it's, but it's trying to remain stable. There's not a whole lot of room in this building. So the foundation types that we select have to be able to handle a lateral stress or the car trying to push sideways. That's the stress that we're trying to resist. Not so much a downward force, like a heavy load being applied downward. It's all lateral. And that gets into this deflection that I talked about earlier, about this one eighth inch deflection. Now, let alone the, the rod itself, the rod is within a building. The building cannot be attached in any way to the rod itself. So we have two different foundation types to support the building, which is separate from the rod itself. Now, this is an iterative process of what we have to do for the rod foundations. Because again, as I mentioned, the loads have not been given to us at this time. We only know that the lateral load of this particular coaster, we have to withhold a, a minimum criteria, this one eighth inch deflection, that's all that's allowed. So we have to kind of try a whole bunch of different methods of doing a design without having the design. And then we kind of get to where we say, what can the soils handle while we assume what type of loads that are going to be uh, um, able to handle it? So one of the ways, again, as I said earlier, the easiest way is to just drive a pile in the ground. That's very simple. It's very easy. It's very readable readily available. Well, we get into what we call batter piles. Again, as the pile, as the cars are trying to push the track sideways, what we talk about a batter pile is we drive a pile in at an angle. So that angled pile, as it gets driven into the ground, it's going to resist a lateral force. The problem is in a very tight, in a very small area, um, let me go to this drawing again. In this very small, very tight area, the number of piles that would be have to have and drive them in um, at a batter, they start intersecting with each other and they start getting each, in each other's way. So we have to make sure that, that that cannot happen. And by doing that, we found out there's too many piles, there's not enough space that a driven pile foundation will not work. So we get into then what else can we consider? on supporting this rod in a way that it's not, the, the foundation itself is not gonna intersect and impede the foundations for other sections of the rod. So we get into drilled shafts. Drilled shafts are very large diameter foundations drilled down into the ground, 30, 40, 60 feet into the ground, depending on the loads. They can handle extremely high loads because these are very wide foundations. These are 36 to 60 inch and diameter foundation systems. They can act as a single pile because it's so large, it can carry so much weight and also handle very little deflection because of the size of it. Um, that this is this was the preferred method that could be utilized in, in the, the, the rod section that's within the events building. The problem is, again, we still don't know what the final loads are. So the designers came to us and said, well, he, we want to be able to, when we get your information, we want to very quickly be able to determine what pile size and how deep do we need to install these piles. We want to be able to determine that on our own, but you got to give us all this information up front because you don't have the loads. So we develop various charts and graphs for them. So as they're going through their design process, they can, they can very quickly evaluate, we've given them uplift, bearing, and, and lateral stress of what these piles can handle. And they go in and pick the right chart for the right area, for the right section of the rod. And they can very quickly then start completing and finalizing their design based off the loads in that particular area. 
So these were very, but again, we these take a long time to develop these because of just how, how much we have to do without having um, the correct information. And we'll discuss a little bit how these things are even constructed in, later in the presentation. The next, the next hurdle we faced on this particular project is the foundations in the Rhine River. Um, as you all know, as, as uh, whether or not you're on the Big Bad Wolf or the Loch Ness Monster or some of the other, um, the Sky Ride, you know, you go across the Rhine River. And on the old um, Big Bad Wolf, similarly, went out, the track went out and extended over the waterway. Well, Bush Gardens in their in their um, design, they wanted to reuse the existing foundations that were in the water. Well, again, we didn't have but so much information on that those existing foundations, so we have to make a lot of assumptions based off the of historical data, any some some additional supplementary um, soil information that we collect, and then we have to run design analysis on those foundations. Can those found those old foundations? handle the new loads of this new track? And will that track even go over top of the old foundations? The alignment doesn't match up in a lot of cases. So we, we take that into consideration. And again, this is a depiction of the old drawings for this coaster um, where you can see the all of these pile caps and piles, the, the linear down that extends into the water. These are all in the water. And it shows the orientation on the right drawing. It shows the orientation of the piles and how the track is running around the piles. So that's the old setup. So we take this information. We do a lot of um, trial analysis and run in design. As the, as, the, as the coaster car comes down the track, it makes its turn through one of the S's, and then it advances to the next S turn. The stresses are, are being manipulated on those pile foundations, um, positive and negative, as it goes around that track. So it's having different stresses. It's having a different downforce stress and different lateral stress. It's trying, while one side is trying to push the car off the track, the other side is trying to pull it back into the track. So there's all sorts of different stresses that we're trying to design for. And as I said before, it's an iterative process. We have to continually run this analysis a whole bunch of different ways. There's four different um, forces that we're considering as this car is running around the track in these locations. And we translate that to how is that going to intersect with the existing foundation? So as we as we do this design, and this is the, the, this is something that we have to come up with, we have to determine where the best point of um, for the foundation support on that old foundation system. And we have to tell them where that point is. And then they have to basically design the rod to connect to that point because that's where the foundation can handle that stress the easiest. So what they did is we have the existing on the right picture here. You can see where the water is. You can see the concrete that is the existing the existing foundation or for the old um for the old Big Bad Wolf coaster. Well, in order to set these foundations up to work for the new rod, we actually had to build an additional concrete cap. So we had to pour some more concrete over top of the existing concrete in order for it to, to work. Now in doing that, you just can't pour concrete on top of other concrete. You have to embed reinforcing steel. And what this does is the reinforcing steel handles the tensional tension stresses of the concrete. <clears throat> excuse me, that's going to be impacted on it by the rod, but it has to be connected to the old foundation. So they 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 drill in holes um, throughout the entire pile cap and insert the steel rebar, the steel um, the steel pieces here that are inserted into the into the concrete. And that's what really connect these two foundations together and make them perform as if they're one. Now, everything we do in the construction industry, design industry, construction, construction industry, it's easy to have stuff on paper. You got to make sure it works. So one of the biggest things we do is testing of what was done in the field. Now, on all those pieces of rebar, what we do is called a pullout test. So we drill a hole into the concrete and we use epoxy. So basically cement, epoxy cement. We stick the rebar into a certain depth 
and the rebar, the steel has to be a certain dimension or certain um, diameter size. And then we literally pull on, put on a device and we try to pull the thing out of the pile cap to make sure, is it connected to the pile cap to handle a certain stress? And we test every one of these things to make sure the design of what we did on paper works in the field in a practical method. So let's go back now to the drilled shaft. You know, uh, some of you might not be fully aware what a drilled shaft is. And during construction, how do you even do something like that? There are three different methods for drilled shaft. There's cased, dry, and wet. In a cased drilled shaft, that means you're installing basically a giant diameter steel pipe in the ground, the full length of what you got to install. And then you dig out of the soils, out of that steel pipe, and you can construct the um, construct your foundation type. There's a dry method where you can just dig a hole in the ground to and think about if you're going to dig dig a circular hole 60 feet in the ground. In the dry means there's nothing to resist the hole from collapsing. It's just the soils hold themselves open. Down in our region, we have to deal with the water table. And the soils are not as strong as you might think at various levels. So we have to do everything what's called in the wet method. So we can't just dig a hole and, and it, uh, we can't just dig a 60 foot hole and everything's gonna be held open. So what we gotta do in order to dig that hole, we develop a slurry mix. And that slurry mix during construction is what holds the soil particles in place as we dig down through the entire length of the excavation. So again, this is a very simple little uh, depiction of how this is done. <clears throat> they're drilling a hole in the ground. And as they're drilling, you can see where the water table is. So the, the blue line is the water table. And we, we mix in a slurry as they drill down in the hole. The slurry is always in the hole. And you can see at the very bottom of that, that shaft, you see these, um, these augers. And that's what digs down into the ground. So they drill down a little bit. They pull that auger out. And then they go back in the same hole, they drill down a little more, pull out the auger, go down a little bit more, and they keep doing this process until they reach the depth they need. But because they have a, this slurry mix in the hole, that's what's holding that, making that hole stable. So the sides don't collapse on itself. Once they go down to the required depth, they clean the hole out with a special device. They insert the rebar cage, and you'll see a picture of that here in a little bit. And then they place the concrete. Well, because there's, there's water, there's slurry, there's all sorts of just nasty mud, as we call it, in the hole, they have to place the concrete from the bottom up. They can't just back a truck up to this point and just dump it at the ground surface. So they put it down what's called a trimmy pipe that goes all the way to the bottom of the hole, and they start placing the concrete. And as the concrete starts filling up from the bottom, all of those slurry and the water and everything is riding on top of that concrete. So the higher that concrete gets from the bottom up, all that slurry is spilling out on the ground. So they, the contractors have to manage cleaning all that stuff out because it's a tremendous volume of material, of a slurry material that's coming out of the ground, riding on top of the concrete. And they have a way to capture that by pumping it into a tanker and reusing the slurry mix so it's just not completely wasted. But it is a very messy process during construction. So this is a, this is a picture of um, the events building construction area. Uh, the structure at the top of the hill is the, the, um, the German auto, the Autobahn house, which is basically the bumper cars in Germany. And in the background is the mock tower. Um, I have a little picture of that during construction at the end of this presentation. That was another one that we did that had a unique foundation system by itself. But at this point of the stage of construction, you see a lot of earth, earth um, mass out there. We've already um, placed over 20 feet of fill to make this particular building pad area level. So we've done a lot of testing already previously to, um, to make this building pad level and ready for construction for this next stage, which is the building and the rod itself. Um, you can see here in the lower kind of right portion of this screen is some, some steel, um, 
some steel pipes. Um, they're utilized to kind of help stabilize the upper portion of the hole while we're drilling down to the bottom. Now this is uh, not very clear, but um, as you can see on the middle and or the right side, the right side of the augers, and you can see what looks like just a muddy, fluidy mess coming off of those augers as it's digging down into the ground. That's what we're pulling out, and that's what it looks like when we're pulling out the soils as we're as we're digging down to this sixty foot depth mark um, that a lot of these piles extended down to. So you can see it's a very messy process um, um, during construction. Now you would think um, on the left side here again the hole has been has been dug. Um, you see this, it's, it's just this, what we call the slurry or the mud mix. That's what's holding that hole open and it's not collapsing because the, the density of the mud mass or the slurry mix is heavier than water and the mass of the soil. And that's what allows that, that hole to stay open. Um, now, one of the things that's critical for us is to make sure we have a nice, firm, flat bottom. Well, you can't really look down in the bottom of this hole and see that it's it's flat and level to receive the concrete. So basically we just drop tapes, uh, a, a measuring tape at the bottom of each side of the hole and we evaluate whether or not it's as flat as can be. Um, and if it's not, if one side is higher than the other, they put the augers back down in the hole and they keep spinning it and they have a clean, what's called a clean out bucket to flatten out the bottom. And that's our method of evaluating, are we on a flat level surface or not? <clears throat> Excuse me. Once they do that, then we have to install the rebar, the structural reinforcement for the drilled shaft that goes down in the ground to, to actually then, that's what makes this pile strong enough to handle the stresses that it's going to be, that's going to be forced upon it. Now, here's just a picture. You can see the size, you see the people on here and the size of the steel cage that gets lower down into this hole. Um, now you kind of wonder, well, how do you, how do you keep this, uh, this steel cage even going down in the hole and making sure it's level? Is we use uh, a system what's called these spacers. So they're just basically these plastic rollers that are on the outside of the steel rebar cage. And that's really what maintains that steel cage in the center of the pile. Or the of the hole in the ground, so you're not having the steel sitting up against the soil. You want the steel to be completely encased in concrete. And here on the lower right, you can see the 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 steel cage encased in concrete in the ground. Now, one of the things I also want to point out to you is it might be a little harder to see, but there are these there are four steel pipes that are attached to this rebar cage. Now these, these pipes are in there for a very specific reason. <clears throat> you know, as, as I said before, we're pouring concrete from the bottom up. How do we ensure that the concrete is uniform and consistent and, and, and safe basically? So what these tubes are called, they're cross hole sonic they're for cross-hole sonic logging. So this is a method of, of electronic pulses that we can put a transmitter and a receiver in opposing sides of the pile cap, of, or I'm sorry, of the pile itself. And what that does is one, one of these receivers, transmitters and receiver, goes all the way to the bottom and it, and it creates a signal that the other, the receiver picks up on the other side. And we do this at the entire length of the pile. And what this evaluate, uh, it allows us to evaluate the integrity of the pile. Is this pile consistent? Did we have any blowouts in the side of the soils that we couldn't see? And is this, is, is this a uniform mass? Um, so again, here it is again. I don't, it's a little hard to see, but we have these four tubes in the ground around the, the steel cage. <clears throat> and we have a guy um, with his instrumentation, it's basically a computer that controls these devices that we lower down into the ground. So with that, we develop a profile. So the one on the left is a nice, clean, uniform picture of this pile. It tells us exactly the diameter of it. And these lines, as you can see, they're vertical lines. It's very clean. 
that's a good picture of a pile that is intact and very uniform. That's what we're looking for. <clears throat> All the piles out at Bush Gardens are good like this. The, the picture on the right, as an example, is a picture of when it is not uniform, where you did have a problem, where the concrete separated for some reason from as you go through the length of the pile. This is a very bad situation because the whole purpose of developing the strength of this pile and the foundation is to ensure the whole foundation system is, is uh, the integrity of the entire foundation system is intact and uniform. This would be a, a, a pile that we would say does not meet the criteria and it would not be considered suitable for support of any part of this ride. So we can draw a picture exactly to show us what is going on on these foundations. The next thing, as I said, in the open areas is, is, uh, is we utilize an electronic device called a pile driving analyzer. These are piles that are installed. These are pre-made piles that are driven into the ground with a giant hammer that's either dropping a weight or hydraulically pressed into the ground. We can basically hook up sensors to this pile. And as the pile is being driven, we can record the stresses of the pile to, to understand and know the capacity of the pile as it's being driven. So again, it, it gives us this information, similar type of plots that we can interpret and it develops the strength, the axial strength, and at the toe, the bottom of the pile, and also how much strength the soil is grabbing the sides of the pile. So this gives us a lot of information of everything that's being done in the field that we did during the design process are matching up. So our calculations are showing to be true. So as we talked about here, um, I got a lot of cool pictures on about how this is coming about. So again, this event's building <clears throat> where the coaster comes in and it does a series of loops and turns. It's dark, it's flashing, there's all sorts of stuff done. So this is a conceptual drawing about the coaster entering the building, going through these series of loops and turns, and then it comes back out the other side of the building. So here is the events building itself. The foundations have been installed for the ride. Um, obviously the track is not installed, but now we're developing the slab and the side foundations for the building itself. And if you look in the upper portion or the right portion, you see these small little square blocks that are in the ground. Those are the specific points for the ride foundation system. So those have already been predetermined. We've already installed the foundation system. We're coming in now and basically filling in the floor slab area and the building, which again is supported separately from the rod. Now, if you look to the top left of the building, uh, you see these slopes over there. We have to make sure for the safety of the workers who are entering this site, uh, that slope isn't just going to fall down. And it did at one point that we had to go in there and help them fix the slab slopes. So it's a, it's a very, um, it can be a very dangerous situation of just walking on the side of a, of a, of a soil slope um, for fear of that slope falling. So we have to analyze that to make sure it's stable and safe and not going to collapse. <clears throat> so here we are in the construction process of installing all of the rod supports for the track elements in, in as they're going to traverse within this inside this building. So you can see um, through these pictures, uh, the track is starting to get installed on top of all these pylons within the building. And on the right is the actually the elevator, the piece that the car runs into drops this, um, this distance, and then it shoots out on the other side of the building. And here basically is a completed picture of the track itself. You do, you do not see this, you do not necessarily feel this when, you, you're, when you're on the coaster and you enter in this building and you're going through all these loops and spins and circles. This thing here, if you're a, a roller coaster ride enthusiast and you like to hold your hands up during the ride, this might make you think twice about holding your hands up because of how tight and short and narrow this area is. But you can see it's a very tight area where the track um, on how a track is conversing. So here it is with this the steel shell of the building going up. So again, the building itself is completely separate from the, the foundation system that the coaster 
is supported on. But you can see now that we're encasing the building or we're encasing the coaster within the steel structural framing of the building. And here's the completed building. Um, again, on the on the the upper side of the track or the the track that's um, that's toward the top part of the screen, that's where the track is entering into the building. And then again, it's dark. There's flashes of light in this building. It's going through all these dips and turns and drops and, and high, highs and lows. And then on the lower side of the track is where you come out of the building itself. So this is where we're um, doing the staging and, and construction of the track in what we call the open areas and or the steel, uh, the covered bridge. So the structure on the right is the cover bridge, the steel casing for the cover bridge, which again, it's built, I call outside of the track. It's not connected to the track in any way. It's a separate structure that the ride just runs through. And, and that's very critical because again, the behavior of the soils based off the loads of that is different than the behavior of the soils for the coaster itself. And then it comes down from that drop and then it enters into the foundations that are then going out across into the waterway of the old, of the, of utilize, reutilizing the old foundations. <clears throat> now, as I said previously, everything we do, we have to verify that it's meeting a design criteria. All these coasters are put together by bolts. And every bolt that we put on this ride has to be tested. So we, we have actually torque wrenches that has a specific tension that we have to check and we do it for every bolt on the rides because we want to make sure the rides aren't going to you know the pieces of section are not going to fly off um during the, the the coaster going around or the the cars going around the track itself so we literally check 100 of every bolt to make sure it's hit the required strength um to hold that track together and this is not for the 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 uh people who are afraid of heights on the left, you can see the bucket um, that's carrying the, the guy on the right. <clears throat> it's carrying, it's swinging him through the air close enough to the track where he can actually put a wrench on that bolt and physically turn it to make sure it's met the required strength to hold that section together. And we do this on every section of, of piling, on every section of track, on every section of rail. We have to check every one of these things. And this actually ride was was uh, National Geographic actually did a story on this particular ride in the in this coaster and how they how they come together. And this actually the picture on the left was actually a picture off of <clears throat> excuse me, the National Geographic um, show. Um, this is the Verbolton ride right here where you have some workers again they're just putting pieces of of section of the rail together. Um, and then you can see on the right that is just in the in the um, in the the covered bridge tower looking straight down the rail as it then goes out into the waterway. So this is this is not something that is uh, again you cannot be afraid of heights to construct these things because they're swinging you around a hundred and some feet up in the air and you don't have much holding you up there except sitting in a bucket. <clears throat> now the, the next fun thing that we do, we used to think it's fun until we really realized, you know, ev again, everything I said is, it's tested and it's inspected to make sure everything is safe. So once the ride is built, they wanna make sure that the ride is safe for the loads of everything that's come together that we've, <coughs> excuse me, that we verified during construction. They, they're required by, by code to run the ride a certain number of times with nobody in it. Then they load it up with weight bags in, in the ride cars and they run it a certain number of hours that many times. And then they open it up to people. Now, the first people to ever ride this ride are the workers that put it together. Now, I used to think that was a fun little thing that they did for us. But, um, you know, we say, hey, hey, and, and uh, recognition of, of the hard work the designers and the workers putting this thing together, we're going to let you guys ride this thing first. Well, in reality, we we are the first live crash test dummies on this ride. So they, you know, they they I liken this back to 
they put us in there to say, how safe do you feel with the design and also the construction and inspection that's been done on this? Everybody who's had a part in this thing, do you all feel safe enough to ride this? So they put us in there as the crash test dummies to make sure this thing works. Um, so that's, it's always just, it, it still is though. It's a fun thing. I will say knock on wood in my 30 some years of doing rides um, out there at Bush Gardens. Um, we have not had any failures or anything like that at, at this particular park. There are things that have to be tweaked and, and things like that. That's with any particular project. You got to tweak things occasionally. Um, but it's a fun, it's a fun little celebration at the end of the job that, that we get a chance to kind of do this. Um, the other, the other, just quickly, last couple slides here, and we can open up for questions if anybody has it. But as y'all remember before, some of the background pictures was the mock tower. That's a, a, a big giant steel tube that is constructed in the air by itself. Nothing supporting it except for the foundation underneath it. And as you know, on that ride, you, you take a chair all the way up to the top and then it drops you um, free fall to a certain distance. And then the, the brakes catch you and you kind of rebound a little bit. Again, it's a similar, similar process. It's just a different load, a different set of analysis that we have to do. And in this one, we're not swinging from the outside. We're actually checking the bolts from the inside. So we're actually, and on the picture on the left, you see it's laying on its side, but you see this steel chamber here. That's the ladder that's on the inside of this, of this um, tube that sticks up in the air. In the far right um, picture, you see this red ladder that leads up to this tiny little porthole. That is uh, when you stand the, 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 the steel pipe up and as you start marrying up or sitting one steel section on top of the other, that is our access point that we have to climb in that hole and then start climbing up this thing. Um, it's extremely dark. You can't be claustrophobic. It's considered a confined space. So we have to pump in oxygen and have monitors, make sure it's safe environment. And the person inside that chamber has to do a torque wrench in each one of these pipe sections, there, there may be 120 bolts that go around the diameter of this pipe. And again, everyone has to be checked at every section of this pipe. So this is just a unique, different uh, perspective for that particular type of, of rod. And then of course, the Griffin. This created its, its own set of challenges, and in, but in similar fashion to the Verbolden. It, it is a unique type of rod. Every coaster out there is different. This one does not have a drilled shaft foundation like we were discussing earlier. This one was entirely built on driven piles. Um, and again, it was a reason for doing it that way because of accessibility and also the design components of what we could do. Um, you know, so that was a unique challenge by itself in, in the process. So, you know, I know we went over a lot of things really fast and it's hard to get down into too many dirty details of, of how we do the analysis and things like that. But, you know, roller coasters provide unique challenges to design and construction that are totally different than you would think about for a building or even a bridge for cars or something like that. And just like your tools in a toolbox, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to evaluate how and why these type of, of structures are designed a certain way. So with that, um, you know, I, I thank you for, um, you know, just allowing me a chance or asking me to give, you know, talk a little bit about this. It's a little different than maybe some of your other presentations you might have um, have been given. But hopefully you, you kind of found for, for the, the, the STEM-minded people, hopefully you found some value in, in that. And for some of our younger members that I see on some of the video, you know, hopefully they just see it as, as being a cool thing, but maybe kind of paint a picture to them that there's so much that goes into these things that you just do not think of until you see the final product and actually riding the coaster. So with that, Jim, I'll turn it back over to you if, if anybody had any questions or, or comments or anything. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we got time for probably one or two questions. Uh, so. Can you maybe briefly explain why is it that the coaster can't put any load on the events building or the covered bridge? Well, because it, it um, that's a good question, Jim. It, it is a settlement <clears throat> issue. The building, if the building were to settle 
or move, it's going to immediately impact the rod itself. Similarly, if the rod were to settle or move, it's going to impact the building. So we very specifically, we do not tie those two foundations together because the stresses are, are, are being um, handled differently. So the building, uh, again, just think of a, just a traditional building. It's a, it's a static load or what we call a static load. It's just a simple download force that with no movement on it. It has no dynamic load. And I'm not going to get into the, the, um, the analytics of the wind load on the building and things like that. That plays into it. But generally, it's just a big weight that just is straight down force and the foundations are handled a certain way. The rod is considered a semi-dynamic load. And by that, I mean the load is moving. As that car goes around the track, it's trying to push the track off of the foundation system. And because of that, we don't design the, the building in conjunction with the foundation. It, it's just easier and better to be separate. If it were to be designed together, it would be a massive foundation system because we would have to incorporate all of the rod loads onto the building loads. And it's just, it's that costs money. Um, we can design anything, but it just costs money. And we always want to be conscious of how much something costs. And going back to when you were uh, checking the uniformity of the concrete in those piles, when you end up with a situation where you have an anomaly in, the, in that pile, how do you resolve that? Do you have to dig the whole thing out and just pour it again? Uh, depending on the size of the pile, you have to abandon it, leave it in place because you're not going to dig, <clears throat> you're not going to dig a 60 foot diameter, 60 foot deep piece of concrete out of the ground. That's just not going to happen. So basically you have to abandon it if it's determined that that pile cannot be salvaged for any use. And you'll have to put in additional foundation elements or additional piles installed. And then you'll have to have um, a structural analysis to span over that segment that's considered to be failed. That's why a lot of attention goes into a contractor and a specialty contractor, not just digging somebody who can go out there and dig a hole in the ground. They got to be specialists in what they do. And there's a lot of uh, meetings that we have before their particular procedure is done. And we also do what's called test piles. We actually do pile tests or we dig holes in a certain area that's removed from, from any part of the, built, of the rod foundation as a test, we want to make sure their procedure is going to have the, 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 the highest percentage chance of working. So we can actually address problems prior to they actually become a real pile foundation for the rod. We actually do several of these to make sure that their method is, is good and the quality is good before we have to worry about them hitting an actual foundation element. Okay, so last one. We got this question several times. Uh, how often is the torque on those nuts checked once the construction is done? <clears throat> it's once, a, well, again, at, at by the time we certify, we sign off on the rod, 100% of the bolts have been done at the very end of the project. So we've done it 100% of the time. The park is required every year to do a random amount of bolts, a certain percentage of bolts every year that somebody will go out there and check the torque on those bolts. If they find that some bolts are not torqued properly or they've become loose over time, they have to then, there's a method of procedure in accordance with what the building code states for them to then go and then start increasing the number, the random number of bolts that they check. And they of course tighten them as they, as they go along. So as they do become loose, because over time, everybody knows bolts and knots and washers, they do become loose. They have to go in and they check all these things. But it starts with a random number um, or a random percentage, and they increase it if they start seeing something. Now, that's every year. I believe it's every, every two to three. I don't remember exactly that number. They are required to go in and physically check 100% of the bolts again. All right. I think we're probably going to have to stop it there. We are out of time. Mike Galley, thank you so much for being here. Great presentation. Uh, we got great feedback in the comments from the audience. 
Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, learning more about our world. Uh, please join us next week, uh, Wednesday, April 28th. Uh, and we're going to uh, have Dr. Maria Molina. She's a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And she will be presenting Using Machine Learning for Climate Science. Uh, so that's going to be a great one. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend. It is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for coming.